Hello there, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Things We Said Today, our weekly uh, Beatles podcast, which uh, in which we cover uh, basically all things Beatles, both uh, their history and uh, and what's going on today, and uh, all things in the in the the Beatle world. I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my uh, my three cohorts. First, the uh, the host of uh, the syndicated Beatles music show, uh, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hey, Ken. Hi, Al. How's everyone doing? Good, good. And from uh, Examiner.com, the uh, the writer for Beatles Examiner, as well as a, no- uh, a number of other Examiner columns, uh, Steve Marinucci. Hey, Steve. Hey, Ken. I uh, hate. <laughs> 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 oh man, did I blow that? Hey Al, uh, hello everyone. We all look the same here on the East Coast. There we go. And our uh, our resident uh, musicologist, uh, a longtime classical music uh, critic, and also a longtime uh, contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine up there in Maine, Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey Al, hello everyone. Tonight's uh, tonight we have a special guest. Uh, we're now uh, just uh, we're just under a month away from the 50th anniversary of uh, probably the most the single most important rock concert in say the first decade of the history of rock and roll, and that's uh, the Beatles' first concert at Shea Stadium, August 15, 1965. And uh, we have, uh, as our guest, the author of a, of a book on, on the Beatles at Shea Stadium, as well as uh, a book on uh, the Beatles' two concerts in Cleveland. And his name is Dave Schwenson. Hi, Dave. Well, hello, guys. How are you? Good. Good. I mentioned I mentioned earlier I was listening to your introductions and hellos and I'm just waiting for you know the Marx Brothers hello hello hello. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, isn't that the Three Stooges? So they do both, you know. Oh, okay. I think they got mixed back and forth, you know. That's I mean, true. You know, maybe Stones we should can, mention that Dave also writes about comedy. <laughs> that, <laughs> as a matter of fact, that was going to be my first question because you know a lot of people think that uh, that. Uh, people who write uh, Beatles books are, are strictly involved in the in the Beatle world, and uh, Dave comes at it from a different uh, from a different path. Uh, you're a uh, now you were I think at one time a comic, and you're now kind of a, a comedy coach. In well, wow, it's a long story there. I worked uh, behind the scenes mostly as a talent booker. I've worked for the Improv Comedy Clubs. In mm-hmm. uh, New York City, sure, and out in Hollywood, and uh, with a television show we used to have called A and E's an Evening at the Improv. I know, I remember that. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've I've been to uh, let me see the Cleveland Improv is in there, and now I'm working out of the uh, Chicago Improv. I'm a I'm a comedy coach. Mm-hmm. So there you go. I work what with does, comedians. What does a comedy <clears throat> coach do? I tell people whether they're funny or not. <laughs> You guys mm. got a lot of work to do. I'm telling you, this right is now. true. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I run. Uh, I've written a few books. Actually, my I'm probably better well known for my comedy books, <laughs> at mm-hmm. least in the, you know, the comedy circles. Uh, I've written books like How to Be a Working Comic and Comedy FAQs and Answers, uh, interviewing a lot of the comics, uh, very famous people I've worked with through my career, just uh, how they went about uh, becoming working comics and writing material, all that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I do seminars and, and workshops uh, about the business of comedy and also about performing, what we might have been looking for when I was booking the, the TV show an evening at the improv or the improv clubs, that sort of thing. So, yeah, that's a comedy coach. That's what I do. That's, that's the day job, guys. Mm-hmm. Mm. So how did that then, how did your path get to writing about the Beatles? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that one. When I left Hollywood, I, I moved out to Cleveland, where I'm from. It was, you know, basically family reasons and everything with some young kids and stuff. And uh, I was doing my comedy workshops there. But I also uh, started writing for different newspapers in the state. I was writing a weekly humor column and then also doing concert 
and club reviews, starting out with uh, comedy. I was interviewing all the comedians, people I knew like Ray Romano and Drew Carey and George sure. Carlin and all those people. Uh, then I picked up a music column while I was there. So I started, believe it or not, writing reviews for people like Paul McCartney or Britney Spears and uh, the Monkees. I got to hang out with them and mm. uh, it just had a real blast. And so I was just writing all the time. And I remember one night I had written like four reviews, concert reviews in a row. One night I had nothing to do. So, of course, I'm stir crazy. I got to write something. And when I was a kid, my mom and dad took me to see the Beatles in, uh, in Cleveland in 1966. Mm -hmm. And it's something I've always talked about, you know, through my junior high school, through college, through my time in New York. You know, I remember hanging around with comedians at the New York City Improv uh, during the Rolling Stones 1989 tour. We're all talking about what's the best concert you've ever seen? What's the best concert? And I always got to uh, trump everybody. <laughs> Because sure. I said I saw I saw the Beatles and everybody's like, wow, what was that like? You got to see the Beatles? And I'm like, yeah. And it was a riot. The kids ran on the field. They had to stop the show. The kids got up on stage. They ripped Paul's jacket. They took the drumstick out of Ringo's hand. It was nuts. <laughs> it was a hard day's night happening right in front of me. And um, mm. so what I did was this one particular night, I wrote a review of the concert so I wouldn't forget things. And I posted it on my comedy website. Say, hey, I saw the Beatles and this is a review of the concert from how I remember it. And the very next morning, seriously, I had an email from somebody that says, wow, you saw the Beatles? Can you tell us more? And I'm like, yeah, I got no life. You know, sure. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I wrote down, okay, here's what else I remember. And then I started getting emails from people who had been at the Cleveland concerts. One of, there were two of them. You know, they started sending me their memories. So I started putting things together. And uh, after a while, I realized, you know, I'd already had a couple books published. But I thought, but this might be something interesting. And so I met with some of the uh, celebrities from around Cleveland that had, you know, a lot to do with the Beatles at that time, the promoter of the concert, the uh, MCs for the shows, the, the big DJs and newspaper reviewers and stuff. And I got all their stories and just put it together. And uh, basically, I wrote it for myself. You know, being a Beatle fan like we all are, mm -hmm. you know, I would have, you know, as a fan, is this what I would want to read? Is this interesting? And I, you know, I really enjoyed it. And it went on to become... The Beatles in Cleveland. So that was the first book that got me into it. Interesting. Now, I'm sure Ken has plenty of questions for you. <laughs> All right, Ken, let it run. All right. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, since uh, we're mainly here to talk about the Beatles at Shea, and I've asked you this question before because I privately inter interviewed you a few months ago, I just think that it's really important just to ask the very general question as to why you think this was the Beatles' greatest concert. Well, Ken, you should agree with me on this, being from New York, Mets fan and everything, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I lived uh -huh. in Manhattan for well over 13 years, and uh, it's the media capital of the world, first of all. It's New York City. Nobody can argue that fact to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anything that happens in New York, it's worldwide. And hmm. I feel it's been that way for a long, long time. So you go back to the Beatles era, go back to 1965. This is the very first big stadium rock concert. It's the birth of Stadium Rock. Elvis right. had done a few shows before he went in the Army, and uh, I have this in the book. He did one at the Cotton Bowl in Texas, and they had about 26,000 people there. Well, the Beatles, about eight years later, you know, had this 55,600-seat state-of-the-art stadium. Shea Stadium was brand new. Okay, it opened in 64. Mm -hmm. And they had never done this before. They were, the, they were the most popular group in the world. Okay, this is after Ed Sullivan, A Hard Day's Night, World Tour, everything else. But now even they were at a pinnacle of their career. And, um, you know, it was just huge. It was just huge. No one had ever done that before. And that's why I call it their greatest concert. I mean, it was the birth of Stadium Rock. They started a whole new thing. You know, everyone else was just playing. They were playing sports arenas before that, 12,000, 14,000 seaters, that sort of thing. And this was unheard of. And, uh, mm. you know, the publicity, the spotlight, is there's no place hotter than New York City. Yeah, but, the, but oh, don't I, you think I, that I think... The, the baseball equivalent of the Beatles is, of course, really the Yankees? So why didn't they play in Yankee oh, Stadium? Oh, jeez. Okay. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Steinbrenner wasn't in charge yet. He probably right. would have him. He would have overseen them or whatever. That's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just, just so, be grateful Charlie Finley didn't do it. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Charlie, yeah, he, he brought him into Kansas City in 64, yeah. paid him some outrageous, right. what, 10000 or 100000 whatever he paid him for that concert. Mm -hmm. But still, that wasn't. New York City. I'm sorry. You know, New York. I agree with you totally. And when you watch the film of that or, or the TV broadcast, it is just so much fun to watch. And 
They look like they're having a blast, and that transcends into the performance itself. Yes. But do you think that it's it's the greatest concert because of it from a historical perspective or from performance? Okay, everybody's going to have a different level. Everyone's going to have a different opinion about that. As far as performance level, uh, you know, the the old timers, the ones that saw them back in Liverpool in the Cavern, and they talk about Hamburg and just what a tight rock and roll group they were. But yeah, I still say this is their greatest concert, their biggest concert. Uh, they didn't have the equipment at that time, you know, to really sound good. But, you know, I when I was researching the book, and you guys have probably heard this too, the, the raw, unedited audio mm-hmm. of that concert, mm-hmm. so they don't yeah. sound bad. They don't sound bad. You know, they did the secret overdubs for the TV show. But, you know, mm-hmm. now the raw audio is out there. And, um, you know, I listen to it all the time. It's on my iPod. <laughs> I mean, I'm listening, and it's like, yeah. it, it's great. You know, and they were just a really tight, good band. Was it their best performance? I don't know. Ed Sullivan sounded really good. That was a great performance. And after that, everything seemed to be, you put them in these big arenas and they really couldn't hear anything. They were playing by instinct. And especially in a, in a situation like that, where they're up against this this wall of screams. Oh, yeah. From 55,000, <clears> you know, mostly teenage girls. Oh yeah, it was like and with uh, no and with no stage monitors. Exactly. Well, point mm-hmm. that Dave that Dave includes in the in the yeah. book, and it's um I don't know if any of you have played in bands without stage monitors. I mean, even <laughs> with I've done it, and um, the first time I ever did it, uh, even you know we I didn't have screaming fans. <laughs> it was a you know the audience was pretty quiet, but the fact is you know you're playing in an amplified group and you're in a hall and basically you start singing into the microphone and you don't hear yourself at all. The first time you hear yourself is about a second and a half later when it comes bouncing back off the wall and it's very disorienting. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how the Beatles managed to stay in tune as much as they did singing all these concerts without monitors under those conditions. It's just astonishing. Well, it just shows how talented they were and how much experience they had playing together. And the one thing, like, I point this out when I do my programs at different colleges and, and Beatle Fest and things like that, when, when you listen to these, these raw tapes and you watch the film, you know, I mean, they do have their amplifiers behind them. You know, John, mm-hmm. Paul, and George can hear their guitars behind them. Ringo always said he never could hear anything on his drum platform. He, he just played, he watched their feet tap, their heads bob, and their mm-hmm. butts shake. And that's what mm-hmm. he was playing too. But, you know, they couldn't hear their vocals at all because right. there was no, sound system like that there were no monitors so those vocal amps were down the first and third bass line so they couldn't hear their their vocals but they're still doing these harmonies you know they're still singing but the one mm-hmm. thing i do like to point out as a great example they played the song she's a woman was their second song at shea stadium it's not in the tv special because it was never filmed there's a whole mm-hmm. story behind that but i i can listen to the audio and you know you guys know the song as well as i do once they get past the lead guitar break and they kick in towards the end of the song they're not playing She's a Woman anymore. They're playing this three-chord Chuck Berry type of rock and roll that the Rolling Stones were doing. Mm-hmm. And to, to me, it just seems like it was such instinct that that's what they were playing in Hamburg. That's what they were playing in the cavern, you know. That's what they knew. They just looked at each other, and they ended that song. It, it sounds like a Chuck Berry song at the end. Hmm. So it's just their experience and how good they were. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I've always said that, uh, that they were really the world's greatest rock and roll band. Oh yeah, no, no argument in my point. Yeah. Uh. Uh-uh. You know, it's just unfortunate that they, you know, that they broke up before the audience, before they were able to perform before the more mature audience that wouldn't be screaming at them, but would just, you know, be cheering them. Yeah, mm-hmm. I always thought it was too bad they couldn't have done a tour in 1969 like the Rolling Stones. Exactly. Did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That was a big changing point with the equipment and the sound and everything. And, again, more mature audience. Yes. Uh, I think that would have really just changed the entire history of the Beatles if that had happened. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steve, I'm sure you've got something uh, in well, mind. Well, what's really interesting, and I think, Dave, you and I have discussed this before, is that Brian Epstein didn't think they, could, they were going to be able to sell that place out. No, he uh, was worried. Right. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think, I mean, that's almost amazing because of the fact that, I mean, you know, in 65 they were, you know, th- that was almost the pinnacle of their of their success. Uh, right. You know, well, and, and. Well, you know, the deal was actually made in 64, 
following mm-hmm. their 1964 tour. And again, nobody had played a rock and roll concert that size. <laughs> you know, again, I wrote about the Cleveland show. They had 12,000 people at that one. Those are the type of venues they were playing. And so when Sid Bernstein, you know, right after the Beatles were on Sullivan at Sullivan show, you know, he had them booked at Carnegie Hall for two shows and immediately sold out. They had to put 300 seats on the, on the stage to, to take up, fill up the extra tickets and their, his friends right. and get them in. And he first suggested Madison Square Garden and took Brian over there to see it. And Brian said, no, it's just, it's too big. He can't, it would have been bad publicity if they had performed anywhere and there had been empty seats. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was right. so important to have right. that word sold out next to those Beatle concerts. So when, uh, after their 64 tour of North America ended in September, Sid suggested, uh, bigger than Madison Square Garden, hey, the Shea Stadium's brand new, let's do Shea Stadium. And Brian said, no, you know, it wouldn't look good for his boys to have a bunch of empty seats there. And the deal Sid made, this is brilliant, <laughs> he said, if there are any empty seats, he would buy them himself for $10 a ticket. And Brian said, it's a deal. <laughs> 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 so that's how they did the Shea Stadium one. And, of course, the, the uh, concert itself sold out by word of mouth, which is just amazing. There was no mm-hmm. advertising, no publicity for Shea Stadium in 65. Exactly. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the 65 show, and uh, I mentioned that you had pointed it out in the book that those those Shea Stadium posters that you see at uh, Beetle Fest and other places, those are fakes. Right. Those weren't made up until about, I don't know, 1999. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there were no po- – he wasn't allowed – Sid was not allowed to publicize at all until he gave Brian a deposit, which was $50,000. And Sid didn't have the money. So as he was leaving the meeting or whatever, he asked Brian. He says, well, am I allowed to talk about this? And Brian says, well, I can't stop you from talking about it. So Sid mm-hmm. went out and talked about it. And the kids picked up on it. He went down to Washington Square Park or whatever. The kids recognized him from bringing in the Beatles and, and the other shows he was doing. And the word just got around. And he waited a few weeks and went over to his P.O. box. And there were t- 10 big sacks of mail for yeah. tickets with checks and cash and everything else in it. And when he, uh, in January of, se- yeah, January of 65, when he went over to uh, see Brian at the Plaza Hotel, Brian expected the deposit and Sid gave him full payment. <laughs> yeah. So that concert was paid in full. You know, a full, what, seven months before the concert was even performed. Hmm. Wow. So, yeah, all word of mouth. That's that's the popular. And the one thing I like to point out, too, and I get this from people saying, well, you know, Grant Funk broke the Beatles record for selling out Shea Stadium. They did it in 72 hours or some some nonsense like that. If the Beatles had had Ticketmaster or any kind of computerized thing or anything at all like they had in the early 70s, they would have beaten that record. Not uh, only that, but it was also after months and months of hype from yeah. Terry Knight, who was the who was mm-hmm. Grand Funk's manager. Sure. You know, uh, the amount. And, and, by the way, Pete Bennett, who is yes. <laughs> that too. Was a big figure in the book. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, Sid had to have all those envelopes open by hand. He had to hire high school and college interns or something to sit in his apartment. And open up each one of those envelopes by hand and count the money and put the tickets in another envelope and mail it. Yeah. And that took weeks to do that. Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. But Dave, th- this concert was mentioned on the radio beforehand, right? Oh yeah. I mean, Scott Ross talked about it on his show out in Long Island. You know, the word got around. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they would pick it up on the street. Hey, it's coming. It's coming. But as far as like official advertising, like you mentioned, the posters and newspaper ads, no, there wasn't any. So it really started with Sid talking about it. And even if you do see some of those, like I have some copies in the book of the newspaper articles from, I think, June and July advertising the Beatles coming to Shea Stadium. Uh, by that time, the show was already sold out and Sid had paid the money and he was only using the Beatles names to sell tickets for other shows that mm-hmm. he was doing, like the Dave Clark Five, the Rolling Stones, the Animals, Herman's Hermits. You put the Beatles on that bill, too, that, you know, August 15th, the Beatles, people gravitate to that they'll look and see the beatles then they'll see oh a week later you know the rolling stones are playing at the academy of music and uh, it just was advertising that way in fact mm-hmm. um uh sid used the uh the the scoreboard at uh at Shea oh, yeah. to, to promote his his new band yeah. young rascals yeah a lot of people uh have right. the misunderstanding that the rascals opened for the beatles at right. Shea stadium no <laughs> I, I heard that constantly from people i had to keep convincing no they didn't no they didn't sid was advertising them right he was just taking over as their manager exactly with uh, these uh you know so the rascals are coming yeah on the scoreboard oh yeah 
Well, that's how you did it in those days. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Mm-hmm. That's true because you didn't have it was uh, you know it was a much it was a much more primitive uh, you know uh, sort of battleground. You know, you had to do whatever uh, whatever you could. That's right. To get the uh, to get the word out there about the about these bands. Yeah, there was no internet or anything like that. So, no. You know, it was the newspapers, it was posters, hanging up posters around the city and whatever they had to do in those days. But, yeah, it's just amazing that, you know, the, this concert, again, 55,600 seats sold out, and it was word of mouth. Can I ask something? Uh, sure. Dave, I was listening to WABC the night uh, in 65, and I'm, and I'm looking at a site here that says it was August 13th. When they were on WABC Live with Cousin Brucey and Dan Ingram, yeah, I, ha- I happened to be taping that, uh, as a matter of fact. I happened to be running my reel-to-reel, and they were playing What You're Doing, and they broke into What You're Doing, and Cousin Brucey goes, we're live at the Warwick Hotel with the Beatles, and I, my, my mouth is, I, I'm literally shaking. My mouth is dropping. I'm going, oh, my God, and they went on with them for about 20 minutes talking to all of them did you talk to i know you talked to bruce morrow for the book yeah um did bruce say anything about that um you know bruce talked about again all this stuff is in the book uh he talked about going back to 1964 in february you know when they first came over the united states and honey befriended them at that Mm -hmm. press conference at the kennedy airport but yeah he you know he talked about being very close to them and Mm -hmm. uh he's you know i'm not he was he's very pleased about that he's very proud about that and mm-hmm. he even talked about a certain picture where all four Beatles are paying attention to it. And I think it was during that time, too, up in that Warwick. Yeah. They were, they were paying attention to what he was saying. He said, those four guys never paid attention all at once to anything. They were all over the place. And, um, yeah, he had a, he had a, a good relationship with them that continued. You know, I mean, he, he had a relationship with John Lennon in the 70s in New York. Right. Producing mm-hmm. shows out in Central Park and everything. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, he, he was an insider. He and, uh, you know, Murray the K, of course. Uh, the the yeah. two of them were the big guns when it came to New York radio at that time. Mm-hmm. That that interview is on the internet. Um, right, it's on. It wants to hear it's on the MusicRadio77.com page. Right, and and it's wonderful. I mean, I remember, I remember it like it was yesterday because it was just so great. And I, and and they were all joking with him. In fact, the best joke that I remember in that interview wasn't from John; it was from Paul, because. Uh, Bruce comes over to Paul and starts talking to Paul, and Paul reads off. I, I guess they had, you know, some kind of insignia or something that said WABC, and he calls him Wabic Radio, which is which sounded to me forever like a John comment. But <laughs> yeah, but but that was that was wonderful. It was great. Um, well, the one so. thing I found, you know, talking, doing both these books, I did talking to the promoters and the people who were backstage working with them and everything. They always commented on their sense of humor. And me, mm-hmm. and of course, we talked about me being a comedy coach. Sure. I really appreciate that stuff. Yeah. But uh, it was even Norman Wayne who produced the uh, 1966 Cleveland concert uh, told me, he says, you know, if they hadn't been a singing group, if they hadn't done that, they could have been a comedy team. He said they were that funny. They were so entertaining. And um, he said he wishes he had had a tape recorder in their hotel suite just to, to catch the stuff they were saying between each other. Hmm. So that's a big part of the Beatles' uh, influence on us, I guess. And they're right. sure. left with us, you know. Sure, that all, of that, humor. all of that goon show yeah, exactly. humor that they had grown up listening to and, uh, you know, which later morphed into Monty Python and, you know, the satire boom and all of that. All right. Mm-hmm. Hey. Yeah, absolutely. Matter of fact, when, you, uh, when Steve mentioned uh, hearing that, that tape from uh, two nights before the show, the night of the show, of the Shea Stadium show, um, Ed Bear, who was a disc jockey, a New York disc jockey, who was just retiring, as a matter of fact, did his show from the broadcast booth at Shea Stadium. And they had gone to commercial and came out just after Ed Sullivan had introduced the Beatles. Oh, wow. And so oh, Ed wow. Bear's trying to, trying to be heard above this, you know, this jet engine type squeal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, they had, uh, I was living in Cleveland at that time. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's where I saw the Beatles. Right. And I, I remember that night at Shea Stadium because our big Cleveland DJ at that time, a guy by the name of Jerry G, 
Mm -hmm. uh, went on tour with the group in 65. And now he's interviewed in my Beatles in Cleveland book because he's real big in the Cleveland concert. Mm -hmm. But he said um, he met the Beatles. uh, He said it was at Shea Stadium. And he was in the third base dugout, mm-hmm. uh, of course, relaying everything back to the Cleveland radio. And I remember standing there, you know, as a kid looking out the window and that Sunday night and listening to Jerry G give me the detail about the Beatles coming out of this, uh, the dugout and running across the field and everything mm-hmm. else. And um, they had to shut it off before the Beatles started playing. Right. They weren't allowed to put any live Beatles music over the airway, so they had right. to sign right. it off. But, you know, many, many years later, 30, 40 years later, whatever it was, when I sat down with Jerry G to interview him for the book, he was talking about that. And I said, doggone, I was listening to you. <laughs> I was right there, <laughs> man. <laughs> Just what great memories. Al, what station was that that you were referring to? Uh, the... w- WMCA. It was WMCA? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. The, the rivalry between those two stations, between ABC and MCA, was just amazing. Oh, could, yeah. was that the, the good guys and the All-Americans. Exactly. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, matter of fact, the, when you see the film, the, what's, what is really amazing is, you know, after, after Ed introduces them, or you see the great shot of the cop holding, you know, holding his ears yeah. because of the power of the screams. But then you see this long shot of of the Beatles walking along, uh, you know, uh, the infield and, you know, with this incredible crowd and all the, the brownie flash uh, cubes going off and all of that. And they're kind of like looking around like, what the hell is this? You know, that's mm. one of my favorite parts of the book or of, of the watching that video yeah. because they're coming out of that dugout. And believe me, the Beatles had never even seen this before. They've been around the world. They've done everything mm-hmm. possible. But that's why this concert at Shea Stadium was so great because when the four of them walk on that field, it's just the four of them. It's the yeah. first time the audience sees them and they're looking around. It's the first time they've ever seen an audience of that size. Mm-hmm. I mean, imagine that. And these guys, you got to remember, the Beatles were like college age kids at that time. I, that's the whole thing about writing these books is about how young all these people were doing all this mm-hmm. stuff. Okay. Right. So they're looking around like all this, but you can see it on their faces. I just love that. And you know, when they start the concert, you can see they're nervous. You know, they're scared and they loosen up as they go on. And by the time, of course, they do I'm down to close the show, John Lennon's completely out of his mind. Yeah. And uh, right. so they're just laughing. And it's, it's almost like they can't believe, you know, here are four guys that, you know, like what, three, four years earlier, they're playing little clubs, basement clubs in Liverpool. And now here they are at Shea Stadium on second base doing this stuff. But, um, yeah, the one thing I also found out when, when I was writing this book, too, is just how nervous they were. I mean, they were scared to death mm-hmm. to walk out there. And they were asking Cousin Brucey, John Lennon. There's a thing in, in the book about John Lennon asking Cousin Brucey, you know, how safe is this? Because mm-hmm. kids were, you know, things were flying out of the stands and all the kids were screaming and going wild. And there's also, a, I guess, the funniest story in the book, too, is how Cousin Brucey really sticks one to Ed Sullivan when they're walking on stage and introduce oh, yes. the Beatles. <laughs> he said Ed Sullivan was a stiff, and uh, he got he nailed him. <laughs> he said, I won't give away the story, but I, I just like that one a lot. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Maybe John's going crazy during I'm Down was, you know, g- getting a little bit closer to what they would have been doing in Hamburg, you know, where they were jumping all over the stage and doing more antics than – than uh, they did later. Maybe that oh. was a, sort of a little flashback to that. Well, too bad he didn't have a toilet seat around his neck, huh? Yeah, yeah really. <laughs> 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 That's true because they were, you know, they, obviously they were doing, uh, you know, I don't know, a fraction of the amount of, uh, you know, sort of work time that they were in the clubs in, in, in Hamburg and in Liverpool. Uh, and they had, you know, sort of toned down, you know, uh, their act. So yeah, that's very possible that, uh, yeah. that you see, you're seeing a little, a little glimpse of the, uh, as they, as, uh, the one album called it, The Savage Young Beatles. Oh yeah. That is one of the best moments though, uh, uh, you know, live moments the Beatles ever had. Watching him drag his arm on that organ is just, is just electric. I mean, that's just, wonderful to watch you can't get through that song well, it's, it's, the, it. it's the joy and it's the happiness it's the fun of Beatlemania. i mean that's what you know those of us who've lived through it that's what we remember it was help it was a hard right. day's night that's what they were you know so to mm-hmm. see that you know yeah those were the guys in help that's who they were at that time and they were right. just having fun it was a big joyous 
thing. And here it was in front of this big stadium filled with screaming fans and the big lights. And yeah, to me, you know, it was just the pinnacle of Beatlemania, the touring years anyway. That was it. Mm-hmm. So Dave, when you <clears throat> interviewed Ron Furman Act, was, was he able to show you his restoration? Uh, parts of it, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, no, I, I got some cool stuff. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I guess I guess probably the the most frustrating aspect of all of this for everybody um, was the fact that they apparently did throw away all of the unused footage, and really, if Ron Furmanet couldn't find it, it's not there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's uh, a little rumor going mm, on mm. that I keep looking into this kind of stuff. Yes, you know, the, matter of fact, that film. Uh, the Beatles at Shea Stadium is just of the concert, but it wasn't originally conceived that way. It right. was supposed that to be the Beatles, yeah, the Beatles weekend in New York. I mean, they arrived on Friday mm-hmm. and uh, they didn't leave until Tuesday. Monday was the rain date. If it rained on Sunday, the concert was going to be Monday. Wow. So they weren't scheduled to leave until Tuesday. Well, the entire time they were in New York City, from the time they got off the plane until they got back in the limos and went out to the airport to leave, they were being filmed. There was always a film crew with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, none of that film was used. In the TV special, they right. decided. Uh, yeah, I have those notes. The, the editing notes are in the book too that I got. That uh, mm-hmm. it, it shows they couldn't use this, or didn't want to use this, or it wasn't good enough, or whatever. And it just was finally decided just to do the concert. So I, I would have rather had more Beatles stuff than some of those opening acts, to be quite honest with you. But, right. Um, hmm. Yeah, it was like the shows in those they, days. Anyway, they were big variety shows. Yeah. You know? So they they, they did that. film. Yeah, they did film the um, rehearsals for Ed Sullivan. Yes. Right. Yes. And that was destroyed. Uh, as far as I know, yeah, they, they were filmed arriving at the Ed Sullivan Theater, leaving the Ed Sullivan Theater. Uh, whether the rehearsals themselves were filmed by that film, yeah, I would say so because it was Ed Sullivan Productions. I mean, yes. I mean, we've seen still pictures of the rehearsals and everything. But you know what? Again, that film has been destroyed. I mean, the story is in the book, uh, but it doesn't exist. Mm. But when I said yeah. there's little rumor things going on, because when they were cutting the film, you know, Clay Adams, Clay Co. Films did it here in the United States. Then he flew over to England with the film to because the Beatles were not happy with the sound. And uh, so he flew over there with the film to show them. And there was still more editing going on. And John, John Lennon asked about the uh, unused film and he asked if he could have it and yeah. check it out. They sent it to him. So. So uh, Yoko might have. Yeah, somebody's <laughs> got it. I mean, yeah. unless it's been destroyed or thrown out, I don't know. But, see, contractually, it was supposed to be destroyed. And I yeah. recently found out some of it wasn't. And it could mm. be in the John Lennon archive someplace. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Wow. It's really, like, in, we're talking about 1965, as Al said, I think, at the absolute height of their uh, popularity. Right. Who in their right mind would throw out, even if it was just the concert, what, did you have 13 cameras worth of material yeah. of the whole show, except for, bizarrely enough, she's a woman, uh, you know, how can all the cameras have run out of film at the same time? Isn't well, that you, strange? No, not really. Yeah. If you think about how this was done, the Beatles at Shea Stadium was filmed like a major motion picture. Those mm-hmm. were 35 millimeter cameras. Okay, right. the same thing they used to film Cleopatra and Ben Hur and all that stuff. Where mm-hmm. you think about later on, like Monterey Pop Festival and Woodstock, those were only filmed on 16 millimeter cameras. Mm-hmm. So the Beatles, that was a big deal. Those were big cameras with big film canisters. And you can see there's pictures of Shea Stadium where there's alarm clocks, <laughs> like on Ringo's drum mm-hmm. platform behind it. They're watching the clocks because everything was timed, you know, to be synced up with the sound or whatever they did in those days. But all the film ran out at the same time. They all had to change their canisters at the same time. So they ran out at the beginning of She's a Woman. So that's really good planning, though. Mm. Yeah, but that's what they did in those days. That's that's how it happened. Hmm. And um, but yeah, they were all changing their film during She's a Woman. So there's no footage of that at all. So shocking. And um, yeah, yeah, and that's but that's why it's such great quality. That film. I mean, the restored version that's sitting in the Apple Vault. I mean, some of it's been released, you know. On, the John Lennon Imagine film. Sure. Uh, that in, footage. In the anthology. Not, yeah. yeah, the anthology. Right. Okay, so that's the restored film. But they have the whole thing restored to that quality. Yeah. And uh, hasn't been released yet. There was also, in the late 70s, when uh, pre-recorded VHS tapes were just beginning to uh, come out on the market, there was a definitely gray market uh, VHS tape called something like The History of the Beatles, 
something like that, which had a uh, you know various film, but they had probably four or five songs from from Shea, and the quality of the film was astounding. Well, you talk about the '70s, so it just only aired like four years before, right? Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't but, know. Yeah, this is uh, a little a little bit later. This is uh, probably late '70s, like '78, yeah. '79, and I probably I, I don't think I saw anything comparable to the quality of that until the anthology. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. and again, well, the John Lennon imagined when that came out in yes. the early '80s. Yes, I remember seeing that down in, in the village in New York City, and when the Shea Stadium stuff came out, it just knocked me out. I'm like, wow, look at this. But they were using studio audio behind it, you know. Uh, right. It wasn't the Shea sound. And uh, But the anthology is. Anthologies. But it's still the overdubs is what they used mm-hmm. um, to mix that. I mean, um, there is a version out there also. I talked to Ron that the original raw audio has also been refurbished or whatever you want to call it, restored. Right. And it's been balanced. It's been recorded in stereo. Mm-hmm. And uh, right. that that has not been released. Even on the Beatles anthology, the, the part two, where they have everybody's trying to be my mm-hmm. baby, George Harrison. Well, that on the anthology, it's in mono. And when I was interviewing Ron for the book, I said, well, I've heard, you know, everybody's trying to be my baby. It's on anthology. He goes, no, you got to hear the, the one we did, the stereo mix. I said, it can't be any different. The fans are screaming. It's a song. Well, he sent me a segment of it, mm. and I compared the two. <laughs> and I, but again, I called him up. I said, I, you just knocked me off my chair. I can't believe how good the, the remix, remastered raw audio sounds. It sounds really good. There is a there is a, bo- a bootleg uh, of uh, a partial stereo Shay that came out what a year ago, two something years like ago, that, something, yeah. something like that. I it, I wasn't that impressed. It was it's okay. It's not. Fantas- it's not as good as I had hoped it would be. Well, I got to um, tell you, there's uh, all these bootlegs out, and at the last uh, couple Beatles festival things I went to, everyone's coming up and saying, "Oh, we've got the bootleg of the Shea Stadium." I'm like, "Really?" And I actually had someone make me a copy of it, and I brought it home and I listened to it. And no, it's not Ron Fermanac's version. It's, uh, it's not. Okay. I don't care what people say. I can tell the difference. And there's even one going around that uh, uh, is supposed to be all, all remastered and everything, and it's. Still, the the TV show overdubs used in it. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I just don't believe that it's really been snuck out of the vault yet, in my opinion. I agree with you, Dave. I don't think so either. Uh, the sound quality on the on that one bootleg with the stereo tracks, and it's not. And what's funny is that the whole the whole thing is not stereo. Only uh, only some tracks are stereo, and yeah, it does not sound. It definitely. I mean, if Fermanek's version would sound a lot better, you just know it. You know? Yeah, well, so. and they're so protective of it. And I'll tell you the truth. The only things that I have, and he shared this with me that I can't, but it's all this techno stuff. You can't make copies or anything like that. But the ones he happened to share with me were the two that are not in the TV show. She's a woman, and everybody's trying to be my baby. Mm. And mm. I can listen to those. And it's like, wow, I mean, this is really great compared to what, you know, I've heard that's out there. So yeah, I do you, do you have any out. sense of why they haven't put it out? I mean, they did this remastering before the anthology, even in yeah. the early '90s. Why is it just sitting there? I have no answer for that. I probably people ask me when they see me at the festivals and they, we talk about the Shea Stadium book and everything. That's probably the question I'm asked the most, and and nobody has an answer. I mean, you got to ask Paul and Ringo and Yoko and Olivia. They're the four in charge. So uh, <laughs> you know, after Neil Aspinall died, you know, Apple went different in a different direction there's different people running it mm-hmm. uh, i've heard that from a number of people uh he was the one that uh, hired ron to remaster all the beatles videos i mean they the washington concert let it be has been done everything but then when neil left it's it's like a different group running the place that's as far mm-hmm. as i wow. know and it's and from what ron told me they're sitting in the vaults everything's remastered and ready to go and nobody's come out with it yet yeah and, and in fact uh going back to the you know the the beginning, uh, you know the concert was August fifteenth, nineteen sixty five. The uh, uh, the film didn't debut in at least in America until January of sixty seven. Right. Why? Oh well, it was okay. It was originally planned for the Christmas season, a holiday special, nineteen sixty five. Mm-hmm. So Clay Adams from Clayco Films, who was hired uh, to do the film. Uh, they had the first edits done 
who by early September, late August, that, that mm-hmm. all that stuff is in the book, and they were ready to go. And they sent the finished version they had to London to Brian Epstein, who approved it. This is great. Let's go. And so it was going to be on television that holiday season. Then the Beatles and George Martin heard it, and they said no, and they said they don't like the sound. And so there was a big um, arguments going back and forth about that because Ed Sullivan Productions wanted to bill it as it happened. That was the billing for the show. The Beatles of Shea Stadium, as it happened. Right. Well, if they overdubbed, that's not how it happened. Okay. Mm. <laughs> they said there were legal mm. ramifications and all this stuff going on. But no, the Beatles refused. They would not let them do it. So it got shelved. It, it wasn't played that Christmas holiday season. And then January of 66 is when the overdubs took place. And they were very secretive because the Beatles were under contract to EMI and they couldn't do it for the different production. So they had to go to a different studio where they used to record all the James Bond music and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And they overdubbed it. But by that time, um, I don't want to say Beatlemania was fading. It wasn't. But there, some of the major television networks had taken a ratings beating doing some kind of rock and roll shows like mm-hmm. a Marie the K special, that kind of stuff. Right. So the interest wasn't there. That might have been. So they were turned down. Uh, even CBS, which was Ed Sullivan Station, it was an Ed Sullivan production. They turned it down. So they hmm. finally got that. I think ABC That's... was the third network, and they picked it up, and it didn't air until January 67. Right before we saw the Beatles in their mustaches and you know psychedelic clothes, they were just getting ready to release Strawberry Fields Forever in Penny Lane, and here we are watching them getting screamed at by the <laughs> Shea Stadium only a couple mm-hmm. weeks before. So talk about a change. Wow. <laughs> Plus, they had ironically, at that point, uh, already in effect announced that they, you know, had no plans for any further, you know, personal appearances as they called them in those days. Well, that was still private information at that time. Mm-hmm. It really didn't come out till around May of '67. Right. That they. But that, yeah. they they had made their decision. Matter <laughs> matter of fact, to talk about my other book. I have pinpointed the date that the public started finding out the people around it was August 14th, 1966, <laughs> is when George and John publicly said to uh, the guy from Caroline, uh, Radio Caroline, that they were not going to tour anymore. And they were overheard by a guy mm-hmm. uh, saying that. But I do, I remember the, um, we were waiting for him to tour in 67. We were going right. to go again, sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. I have a newspaper clipping that's in my other book from May 1967, and the headline says, Beatles may sing swan song. Hmm. And um, it was the announcement that they were not going to tour anymore. And then uh, about a month later, you know, Sgt. Pepper came out and everything changed. In fact, I, I recall an interview that Sid did uh, at right about the time that the, that the TV show uh, debuted on ABC. And he said he was that uh, one of the reasons for showing it was uh, in the, in the hopes that they would uh, that the Beatles would decide to come back for a third show at Chase Stadium. Yeah, well, Brian was still pushing him for that. Yeah, and um, you know, I even have a recording with the Jerry G that was done in Cleveland in 1966 with it, you know, for their fans for the radio. And George Harrison is saying, "We'll see you next year. We'll be back again next year." Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so we thought all systems were go. It was going to be an annual event every summer, a Beatles tour. And they pulled the rug right out from underneath this. Hmm. Hey, Dave, one thing that I, I really find fascinating about all this is that here we learn that this this TV broadcast, this was all done, most of it was done in 35-millimeter film. So here you've got all this high-tech, the best that was at at the time. Yeah. Right? Yes. And then I, I read that Ron Fermanek said in your book that when it came to the audio, they used two uh, quarter-inch, two-track machines. Yeah. When at the time, they could have had half-inch tape, four-track machines. So for since you're saying that the Beatles were not happy with the sound yeah. of the concert, they could have used better equipment. Well, I guess so why didn't they put as much effort behind the audio as they did the video? Well, I don't have an answer for that. I guess 20, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Uh, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, they had the audio running down... Uh, uh, into the uh, it's the pitcher's mound at Shea Stadium, that little tent that was there. You can see mm. it in some of the footage, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. when they're doing I'm Down. You see the guys in their crouch down. Yeah, they had the, the reel-to-reel tape recorders back there. Uh, I don't know why they didn't have four-track. Even that was kind of rare, though, wasn't it, for the studio? I mean, for EMI and everything, the, that was a big deal when they finally got the four-track and put it in there. But, um, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. 
They it's also concerned. surprising mm. because, um, you know, I, I never realized that Bob Fine and uh, Wilma Cozart Fine were involved in this production until I read it in your book. And, you know, on my, the other side <laughs> of my life, the classical music side, um, they are like revered producers. Yeah. Um, they, they made some spectacular classical recordings. So um, and the hallmark of their work was always the sound. I mean, it just, you know, incredible sound. They, they did things for Mercury. And um, so I, I found it very interesting that they were involved in the first place. But it also makes that even more of a puzzle. Why did they do it on two two track machines? Yeah. You know, That's a very good question. I, I, but I again, I don't know how much that technology was available to them at that time. I yeah. think. You know, again, I'll go back to EMI Studios, where the Beatles always complained that the Beach Boys and everyone in America had four-track machines, and weren't they still bouncing two tracks off each other for their first couple albums, something like that? Mm-hmm. And yeah. even Sgt. Pepper was recorded on, what, two four-tracks? Four tracks, yeah. Yeah, and I think they were big, heavy machines they brought in in those days, too. So, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But, yeah, the cameras were the high-tech stuff, though. The, the footage is just great. So the Beatles were using four-track as early as um, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Okay, so we're talking at the end of 63. They could have easily have had it for, for this concert, although maybe the equipment for a live show would have been different from what they would do in the studio. I don't well, what know. What did they use like when they recorded the Hollywood Bowl concerts? And George Martin I think was three track. that. They were using what? Yeah, I think those were three track for okay. the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, I know George Martin was there for part of that. And see, you know, the twist and shout they did at the Hollywood Bowl is what is overdubbed on the Shea Stadium TV special. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, George Martin was not there at Shea Stadium, so this was a different group. You said Bob Fine and some of them. But, um, yeah, it was just the reel-to-reel recorders in the over the pitcher's mound. And speaking of overdubbing, uh, I guess the other real egregious one in the film is uh, is this wobbly, out-of-sync, uh, out uh, bad-sounding uh, version of Act Naturally yeah. that, pl- that plays over Ringo's live version. Isn't that awful? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, he's yeah and when, that, when the bootleg with the... the film. When the bootleg with the actual um, Shea audio came out, I, I listened to that and I thought, you know, that, this version of Act Naturally is really not that bad. Why no. did they? I know. Yeah. Well, listen to what they played the night before on the Ed Sullivan show. You know, they taped Ed Sullivan the day before. Mm-hmm. It was August 14th. Yeah. Right. And they played Act Naturally and, and they sounded great. Yeah. They sounded yeah. really good. But again, they, they were not happy with it, I think, as far as like even the mix they had at that time. I mean, the, some of the microphones – Especially on the raw audio of Act Naturally, you cannot hear Paul sing harmony at yeah, all. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Okay. And mm. basically, when you listen to it, it's Ringo playing the drums and singing. That's pretty much what you hear. And mm. then you hear George's lead in there mm-hmm. a little bit. Uh, yeah. So they weren't happy with, you know, they didn't have the things in those days, the technology, I guess, to separate some of that sound. Because Ron Fermanac can take those tapes and he can take out a lot of the screaming and things. You know, they can, mm-hmm. they can separate all this stuff, which I don't have enough technical knowledge to understand how they do it. But they can. And, um, but the funny thing too about Act Naturally, the fans didn't know what song Ringo was singing. You know, it hadn't been released in this, in this country yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, it was the flip side of yesterday, which didn't come out until September. And it was on the British Help album. If someone had a copy of that, they knew what it was. But Americans, I never, I, no one of us had the Help, the Help album we had had all the soundtrack music on it. Yeah. So the, the people I talked to that were there, they were, the big question was, what's Ringo singing? You know, what song? They didn't know what it was. And I think later on that tour, a couple of dates later, they switched back and had him singing I Want to Be Your Man. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was a new song. Mm. Yeah. I always thought the problem with that naturally might have been Ringo's vocals, but like Alan just said, when you listen, it's not that bad at all. Mm-hmm. I think Ringo in the very beginning was a little bit shaky with his vocals, and then he was fine yeah. right after that. Yeah, no, I think it sounds good, too. I enjoy listening to the raw tapes more than the overdubs, you know. Of course, the overdub mm. for Act Naturally is just the studio version. You know, the story right. behind that, you right. know, the Beatles always kind of got bored after a while doing stuff. And so they went in gung-ho to overdub this television special. But by the time they got to Act Naturally, it was the afternoon. They were done. I just put the studio recording. They're leaving. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and that's really the story behind that one. But at least, you know, if they were going to use it, they could at least use the decent copy of it. Well, they were, like I said, they were pretty much done with it by that yeah, time. Yeah, I guess so. You know, they, they In fact, you know, since, since it was Ed Sullivan or, or Bob Precht producing the, the, the special, yeah. you would think they would have had actually access to the Ed Sullivan show performance from the day before and yeah. could have used that audio. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. that would have been good, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I enjoyed that Ed Sullivan show um, broadcast too at sixty five. I mean, that was really that sounded good. You know, I assume that's could that's how they could have sounded at Shea Stadium also if they'd had the monitors and the yeah. right mixing boards and all that kind of stuff, which they didn't have. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, one of the interesting things too, when I think about that Ed Sullivan, I, this is in the book too. I don't know if I made it clear in the book that it was my cousin who had dinner with the Beatles that night mm -hmm. at uh, Rockefeller Center when they really? snuck out of their hotel. Yes. And um, hmm. so the night of the Ed Sullivan show, when it actually aired in September, she was visiting our family. She was hanging out with us. And the Ed Sullivan show was coming on. And she goes, oh, my gosh, I got something for you. I got something for you. And she opened up her purse, was throwing things out and everything. Next thing you know, she pulled out this Ringo Starr autograph. She goes, here, I got this for you. I'm like, where the heck did you get that? She goes, then she told me the story. I said, why didn't you get the other three? Why didn't you get four yeah. autographs? And she goes, because she didn't like them that much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. And even to this day, I still talk to her. I always say, why did you get the other three? I could have been retired by now, you know? <laughs> But, yeah, that's a great story for the book. And, and yeah. that's just she was right there with them. It was just amazing. Mm. Wow. Dave, who were, who were some of the people that you interviewed for this book that you found the most fascinating? I know you mentioned Cousin Brucie, but um, you did interview the son of Murray the K and yes, uh, Peter, one of yeah. the actual Ronettes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Nedra. I'm a huge Ronettes fan, so believe me, that's the one that I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm talking to Nedra. Uh, yeah, that was just great. Well, Steve Marinucci, that was a big interview for the book, right? Oh, yeah. Ooh, thank sure. you. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, everyone – is special in that book. Like I said, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Beatles fan, so I was writing it for myself. You know, what would a fan like? And the thing about both these books I've done, uh, one lead has always led to another. I'll, I'll be talking to someone involved in the concert, and I'll say, wow, that's really great stuff. And then they'll always say, oh, that's nothing. You need to talk to so-and-so. And I'm like, well, okay, but how do I get a hold of them? They go, well, here's a phone number. Call them. And it, it always moved in those steps. But uh, – The one uh, in this book in particular, we became good friends after the, I wrote this book, too, until he passed away, was Peter Bennett. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, he is really something else as far as not just the Beatles in America, but just the British invasion and pop music. And I mean, I worked with everybody and just had these wonderful stories. And uh, like I said, even after I finished the book, like every two weeks, I would get a call from Peter Bennett, usually on like a Tuesday or Wednesday night. And he'd be like, Dave, what are you doing? You know, how's your mother? How's this? And, that? and we'd sit around and just talk. And it was just, I closed my office door. And two hours later, I come walking out going, like, for instance, here's a story for you. Uh, he called me up on, a, I think it was a Wednesday. And I said, oh, Peter, you know, how are you? He says, oh, you won't believe what I did last night. It was crazy. It was wild. I go, what'd you do last night? Well, he went to Ringo Starr's birthday party at Radio City Music Hall when Ringo turned 70. And Paul showed up to surprise him by singing birthday. Right. And, So he's telling mm. me this, and I'm going, but then it continued. He says, oh, yeah, then afterwards we walked across the street, you know, we went to Ringo's birthday party. So I'm walking over there with Paul, and I don't know who else he's walking with, and Yoko, okay? And so, and he's going, he's telling me, he says, oh, I'm talking to Yoko. She's so funny. That Yoko, she is so funny. On and, on. and I'm on the phone going, what the heck? I'm, I'm this guy <laughs> sitting here in my office listening to the guy who was hanging out with Paul and Ringo and Yoko and everyone just the night before, and he's calling me up and telling me about it. <laughs> So he was just uh, just a great guy, you know, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, and just a, just very entertaining to talk to. But, yeah, and um, Ron Schneider is another one that's in the book who was the Rolling Stones business manager at that time. And he went on later. He produced the movie Gimme Shelter. But uh, his uncle was Alan Klein. And um, uh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know any of this until I started researching this book. But, uh, yeah, Alan Klein was backstage at Shea Stadium with the Beatles and Brian Epstein. And um, we all know what happened a couple of years later with Alan sure. Klein. But there he mm -hmm. was. And I have a picture in the book of Alan Klein standing there with Peter Bennett. And uh, you see John and uh, George and Bobby Vinton and Mick Jagger. Mm -hmm. They're all there. They were all backstage. I didn't know all that was going on. All I knew when I started writing the book was what I'd seen on the television special. And it was basically the four Beatles back there you know, holding up fan gifts from fans and watching TV and tuning their guitars. But there was a whole big scene going on behind the cameras. So that was just fascinating for me. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, you do write somewhat about the, in the book, about the 66 show. In sort of a capsule version, what would you say are the main differences between the 65 
and 66 Shea Stadium Beatles concerts. Well, the big difference was 66 didn't sell out. Right. So, you know, things were changing, okay? A lot of those Beatles shows in 66 did not sell out. That was mm-hmm. a big difference. You know, 64, 65, that really was the pinnacle, 65. Right. Um, things were very different. And I think the Beatles were uh, bored, okay? Uh, in my research, I found out they didn't stop touring only because they were bored and just because they couldn't do their music on stage anymore. They were scared. They were scared to death, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay? Because fans could get to the Beatles in those days. You could get to them. I, when I point out my Cleveland books, the kids got up on the stage. And uh, Jerry G even said, you know, in other cities, people wanted to see the Beatles in Cleveland, but they wanted to touch them. Right. And uh, I have a very disturbing video that I also show about my 66 Beatles concert where it looks like Paul McCartney is getting punched in the face by a, a fan. Mm. And the kids were that close. I show that at colleges and the Beatle Fest, and I ask everyone, I said, what's your opinion? Because I slow it down frame by frame, and you could hear people gasp when I show it. But it was at the Cleveland concert with the kids rushing the stage and all this going on. But yeah, things were different. And in 66, of course, you had the controversy with John Lennon saying the Beatles were more right. popular than Jesus. And um, I, from talking to the promoters in 66, it's, they just acknowledged that just killed ticket prices. I mean, ticket sales. Mm-hmm. They, they just saw a drop off immediately after that date book magazine came out. So it was a whole different time. And, um, you know, I, I assume that affected Shea the same way. You know, things were changing. So maybe they did the right thing by stopping touring and going to the studio and producing, going into Sgt. Pepper and the flower, uh, uh, flower Power Generation and all that kind of stuff. It was just that time. Like you say, though, it's too bad that, say, a couple of years down the road, they didn't, uh, they weren't able to sort of get it together enough, you know, between the four of them to, to go back out on the road for at least one last tour. Yeah. You know, like I said, the Stones doing that in 69, I think really changed their careers. Exactly. And, uh, you know, the Beatles, you listen to the rooftop concert at Apple when they did that, they don't sound too bad. No. Okay. You put that on the road, you add some of the hits and the new songs and I mean, you're talking a big deal. So, yeah, and at that time, too, the kids, the baby boomers were old enough to sit there and actually listen. So there wouldn't have been all that screaming and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. D- Dave? Yes? We know how concerts are these days with security. What kind of security arrangements were there in 65 and 66? Well, uh, it was a lot different. It was a lot different. Yeah, you had Neil and Mal and a lot of prayer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't have... The security, you know, you go today and you see people like, you know, One Dimension or Justin Timberlake, Madonna, all of them. They, they have the big strong arm security guys standing in front of the stage. Well, Paul McCartney, you know, there's barricades. You, know, you can't get near them okay, sure. unless the security takes them on stage. So Paul can write his name over someone's, you know, they get their name tattooed on his right. other arm or whatever he does. <laughs> but no, you can't get near them. But it wasn't like that. I mean, you watch Shea Stadium. It was still New York. So those were New York cops. They weren't going to take any nonsense from anybody so they had those big wooden barricades around and cops and cops and horses and everything else they were pretty secure sid bernstein had to pay for that that didn't come the beatles didn't tour with security or anything like that and the city wasn't going to give it to him so he had to he had to pay for that so the promoters were in charge of getting the security and you know a lot of them were looking to cut corners or whatever and uh, i especially talk about that in cleveland that um you know basically they hired you know some off-duty cops who were maybe a little bit older a little bit overweight uh, they thought they had babysitting duty for the night, and they couldn't contain the kids. Mm-hmm. And, um, wow. yeah, at the Cleveland show around the, the infield of the stadium, just down the first and third base line, you know what the snow fences are, right, those wooden mm-hmm. slats? Mm-hmm. That's what they had. They had snow fences from oh first God. base to home plate, home plate to third base. That was it. And there were some cops hanging around the other side of the snow fence. Well, when the kids ran out in the field, you know, you watch the Shea Stadium film, you see a kid running – through the outfield, and John stops, and he goes, oh, look at that, oh, oh. And you see the police, like three cops chasing the kid, and they tackle her and mm-hmm. take him back. And in Cleveland, what happened was one kid jumped over the fence, and 3,000 kids followed immediately. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, you got, like, about 20 cops standing there, you know, around the pitcher's mound. And so they turn around. They're running to the stage. The kids are running behind them. They all hit the stage at once. Mm-hmm. And, you know, by the time the Beatles finished Day Tripper, their fourth song, the stage was filled with the Beatles, police, and fans. You know, mm-hmm. they couldn't keep them away. So, you know, anybody could have gotten to them, you know, if they wanted to harm them or anything like mm-hmm. that. There, there was no – so, I, you know, I talked to people in the Beatles insider groups, and, you know, they said they were scared. They were really scared. 
With every reason to yeah. be. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I know uh, that scene in um, Charlie is My Darling where the fans jump all over the stones is just, I mean, that's bad enough, you know. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean. Well, I, I still remember the Cleveland show where the girls, they, they grabbed Paul's jacket and they just tore it right up the back. And there were, a girl jumped up on Ringo's drum platform and. I always said she took the drumstick out of his hand, but I since realized maybe he just kind of gave it to her, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, it was just chaos. It was just nuts. And it's like you're standing there with a, you know, next to a beetle, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yeah. Well, what? One thing that you, you just said a few moments ago, the big difference between 65 and 66, was that you could hear them. <laughs> so um, I'm sure... Since you saw them in 66, what was it like from a performance perspective? You know what? As opposed to just seeing, you know, your favorite band up there. No, I heard them. And see, that's the thing, too. I say this in the Shea Stadium book. I, I, I don't want to, you know, here, let's put it this way. If you're a girl or if you want to scream, you don't hear anything while you're screaming. All you do is hear in your own head that you're screaming. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the right. guys I talked to that didn't scream could hear them. Okay, now maybe way up in the upper deck at Shea Stadium, the ones who were sitting in the last row, they couldn't hear anything. Mm-hmm. But the others I talked to, they heard them. And I heard them in 66 at the stadium concert. And I remember talking about it on the drive home, how great they sounded. They really sounded good. And I in particular mm-hmm. remember listening to Yesterday when they did that because it was the first time I'd ever heard it without violins and cellos, that sort of thing. It was two guitars, a bass, and a drum. And they played it during that concert. I always remembered that. And then back in the 80s when the Japanese Budokan shows were finally bootlegged, and you could hear it again. That was the next mm-hmm. time I ever heard it like that, and that's yeah. how I remembered it. No, I, I thought they sounded great, and the people I talked to that had heard them said the same thing. Uh, they were just playing by instinct, because again, there were no monitors. You know, the stage equipment was minimal. I always said even the stage they were on wouldn't even hold Keith Richards amps on the current Stones tour, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were like a garage band standing there, and... Um, but yeah, I didn't scream, and, and uh, there were kids screaming throughout, but they had the music piped through the sound system of the stadium, and plus they had big speakers down the first and third base line, and, and I heard them, and they were great. Uh, Dave, this is, this has been great. This has been a, a very, very quick hour, and uh, it, was, uh, it was fascinating hearing uh, hearing all the stories about, uh, um, as you say, the greatest concert the Beatles ever did and uh, the concert that really kind of set the stage for Monterey and Woodstock and Watkins Glen and all the big concert spectaculars. Oh, yeah. Well, definitely. I had a blast talking with you guys. It was a lot of fun. And uh, and I know we'll, we'll be seeing you uh, in about uh, three and a half weeks. At oh, my Chicago, gosh, yeah. Yeah, at the Chicago Fest for Beatles fans. Yeah, that's right around the corner. Yeah. Literally, I live in Chicago. so I'm That's right. The yeah, well, at least <laughs> this time you won't have to travel. <laughs> mm. But, yeah, you guys, you know, only suggestion I can make is just get new joke writers. Yeah. <laughs> we need them. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can, can we hop- make- Maybe we should hire you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. I'm not cheap. I'm not cheap. I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, I just upped my price because I realized there's four guys that need help. Okay. Right. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> now we're in trouble. A lot of help. Just kidding. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Uh, Dave, we should get, we should definitely get all of your, uh, your contact information, your, uh, your Twitter, uh, Twitter handle and uh, all your other contact uh, info. All right, but just don't call me in the middle of the night, okay? We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got Twitter. You can check me out at uh, at Classic Rocker 66. And I use 66 because that was the year I saw the Beatles. So Classic Rocker 66. I also do a um, blog column, whatever you want to call it, about Classic Rock, and it's called theclassicrocker.com. Mm-hmm. So you can check that out. And as far as the Beatles books, you can go to BeatlesSheaStadium.com, just like a spell, BeatlesSheaStadium.com. And there's information there about the Beatles, uh, the Shea Stadium book and the Cleveland book, and also about the uh, a program I do, educational program I do for colleges and high schools, junior highs, and Beatle festivals and things like that, talking about the 60s and, and Beatle mania, making the 60s fab. That's great. And uh, Steve, I think you've uh, you've got our contact info as well, including our new Twitter uh, handle. 
Yeah, the the email address is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. The Twitter handle is uh, things we said fab. So at things we said fab. We all love that fab word. Yeah, fab. <laughs> yes. it's, it's it's fab gear and all those uh, other himply, pimply hyperboles. <laughs> yeah, you're groovy, man. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Exactly. And anybody else, uh, Ken or Alan, want to give uh, contact info? There's my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. There's trivia there every single week where you can win one of nine prizes, lots of interviews. And I also just want to mention I have a brand new affiliate from my Beatles show, Every Little Thing. And it's a radio station called RadioFreePhoenix.com. It's an all-eclectic music channel with music from the 60s on up. And you can hear my show Friday nights at 8 p.m., and that is uh, Mountain Time, which is two hours before Eastern Time. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I'm kind of excited about that every time I get a new station. So I just want to give a shout-out to them, as well as Fab Four Radio and Pure Pop Radio that carries both Every Little Thing and our show, Things We Said Today. That's right. And Very cool. That- hey, can I throw one other thing in? Sure. Uh, the Beatles at Shea Stadium, just because this is the 50th anniversary year, 2015, uh, we have special book covers that are on the market. They have a little gold seal on them. It oh. says 1965 to 2015. That's only going to be for this year. That's going to go through the new year. Okay. But uh, you can find those on Amazon.com and more information on the website. Sure. Collector's item. Uh, absolutely. And I assume the, the copies you'll have at the festival will have that little sticker on there. You know what? I'll have a limited amount of those copies. So come okay. see me early. Okay. Because uh, those will go fast. Absolutely. And Alan? Oh, you can find me on Facebook under either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and on Twitter uh, at Cozen. Okay. I don't uh, have any prizes. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're working on it, though. Right. <laughs> no prizes, but you could buy one of my books. <laughs> this is true. Anyway. You could buy my book, too. This is my. You could buy my Davy Jones book. It's on Amazon. Very cool. Uh-huh. And you can't buy my you can, well, you can buy my book, but not through uh, Facebook or Twitter. Uh, you, through Parading Press, www.paradingpress.com, or through Amazon.com. Changing Times, 101 Days to Shape the Generation. And otherwise, you can contact me at uh, Al Sussman on Facebook or at. A S U S S forty nine on uh, on Twitter and the three hundred and sixty five reasons why nineteen sixty five is the single greatest year in the history of rock and roll continues. And Dave, again, this has been uh, this has been a blast. Yeah, well, thank you very much, guys. I did. I seriously had a good time. It was a lot of fun talking with you. That's great. So uh, we'll see you around campus, huh? Well, and I'll see you in <laughs> Chicago. That's right. I'll see you there. And for uh, for Ken Michaels and Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, this is Al Sussman, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.